Welcome to everybody. It's a real pleasure to have you all with us for this last stop of PCR webinars on the road. And this time, together with my colleagues since the beginning, Dejan Milasinovic, our final destination will be Madrid, where we are going to join Professor Javier Hescanet. You can follow us on PCR online to get credits, and as well on Facebook and Twitter. And in the next hour, we will talk about a patient with stent failure and how to treat instant tristenosis. As usual, we will try to move from general concept expressed in the guidelines inside the real cat lab, treating a real patient, and so treating cases that uh, every one of us can face every day. So with my colleague, I'd like to see which are the objectives for today. So please, Dejan. So hello everyone, it is really a great pleasure to be with you here once again and it is more than a pleasure to be joined virtually by Professor Escanet in Madrid. So pay close attention, what we are going to be talking about today is basically understanding the mechanisms of stent failure. Stent failure is a relevant problem in our practice and we need to understand why it happens and when it happens, how to treat it. So we are going to also discuss why jack-coated balloons are particularly useful in this patient subset. Now, I would like to go to Madrid and say hello to Professor Escanet. How are you doing? Hi, hello, Dejan. Hello, everyone. Nice to, nice to have you here in Madrid, and welcome to Hospital Clinico San Carlos, which, by the way, it's uh, whenever you come to Madrid and you come to the um, Reina Sofia uh, Museum, where the Guernica is, please remember that that building was the original uh, Hospital Clinico San Carlos in the past. Very nice. So now let us see the video. And I think that we already feel like being in uh, Hospital Clinico San Carlos in Madrid. So let us see the video of your hospital. Thank you. That would be great. Yeah. So we, we prepared this just to show you a, a few, a bit of ambience of what we, where we work and where we have our activity every day. This is the interventional cardiology unit, which actually stands uh, on the work that uh, Professor Carlos Macaya uh, started something like 30 years ago, I, or 35 perhaps. I, I joined uh, the unit 25 years ago. And, um, and what you are seeing here is basically the type of activity that we do in nowadays. We, I have a stick here mainly to the coronary field, uh, bringing together not only what is the clinical work, but also the um, education and research uh, spheres of our work, of our activity. We are trying to bring as many colleagues as possible from all over the world to share with them their experiences, our experiences, and together try to advance together in, in, in a better care of our patients. You may recognize here a few uh, faces from friends that uh, join us uh, frequently. We have uh, invested a lot in having the possibility of having educational technologies. Um, so in a way to exchange and to share knowledge uh, as efficiently as possible. Uh, we have a very active program also that you are not seeing here on structural heart disease. Uh, again, I choose these images just to, because of the topic that we are discussing uh, today. And um, we uh, have, as, as mentioned, a very active um, program of education. Uh, jointly also with the, the University Complutense of Madrid. Uh, we have a, a master that actually brings uh, fellows from all over the world to be with us and to contribute to our uh, clinical research and educational activities. Thank you for this, uh, Professor Scanet. Uh, I, I had the pleasure to visit you there, and it's, I can really attest to, to the fact that it's, it's amazing. It's an amazing educational environment, and I look forward to today's discussion. So could you please start with the first case that you prepared for us? Absolutely. So uh, this is a very interesting uh, topic in sternal stenosis, and I thought that it would be first to share with you a personal checklist. Whenever I am before a patient who has instant stenosis, I ask myself these questions. Is there an identifiable cause of restenosis? And if so, is it a stent procedure or patient related? Second question is, can it be successfully modified? Uh, for that, we will need in many occasions, you know, the concourse of Fumogen. And third, is re-PCI the most adequate therapeutic option? I think that is very important because 
uh, in some occasions, um, the, the type of restenosis that you are seeing is telling you that this patient, for whatever reason, uh, is not the ideal one for treatment with uh, percutaneous interventions. So with these questions in mind, let me show you a, a few cases. This, um, the first case is, is a gentleman, 71 years old, with some cardiovascular risk factors. You can see here, he had an, an inferior ST myocardial infarction. And actually, the operator during the night when the case was performed had trouble in uh, expanding the stent. He did his best, used high pressure balloons, but as you can see here, there was a residual narrowing uh, left uh, in the vessel. But in any case, because the, there was TIMI3 flow, you know, it was deemed that the case uh, was successful. The problem is that in, in, in later in the future, the patient came back with a new ST elevation myocardial infarction. And this case, in this occasion, it was due to a stent thrombosis. Immediately, you established a link between this uh, growth and the expansion of the stent in the development of stent thrombosis. Again, acute setting, the operator tried to open the stent as much as possible. Like in the first case, he failed despite using a non-compliant non balloon up to 24 atmospheres. Um, and then uh, it, it was decided that the patient will stay in hospital and will have subsequent go with a dedicated technique, intravascular lithotripsy, that uh, for this particular uh, type of indication is, is an off-label indication. It's not indicated for this, but we will discuss, discuss more about uh, this in the future, in, in, in the next slides. Uh, so over to you. Uh, yes, uh, so let us first uh, discuss the basics of this case. So if we understood correctly, 18 months prior to this STEMI, there was the first intervention. And it ended up with a suboptimal result of an angiographically already obvious underexpansion of the stent. However, nothing happened until one and a half year afterwards. And then you're confronted with an undilatable lesion. So our first question to you would be, uh, what is it that you usually do when you encounter an undilatable, a resistant lesion uh, in an ACS patient? What is your next step? Well, ACS patients typically are performed uh, around the 24 hours. So that means that it may happen in the middle of the night. Um, and, you know, it depends on the, com on the competence on plaque preparation techniques of the operator. I mean, ideally, you know, everyone should be able to go into use in the acute setting a plaque preparation tool to make sure that you have a proper, you know, preparation of the lesion before stenting. But like in one of these cases, if for whatever reason the, the colleague is not competent, for example, on intravascular lithotripsy or whatever, what is very important is to restore flow, but not call it a day and to uh, plan in hospital, while the patient is in hospital, a subsequent uh, dedicated intervention to correct this. Because otherwise, and the moral of this case uh, illustrates this very nicely, you may have a problem in the future. The patient may have a problem in the future. So. I, I will just ask you, even if uh, uh, it was a STEMI at the beginning and you had uh, a non-satisfying result, uh, could you, after placing the stent, improve this, the, the stent expansion using, uh, I don't know, maybe high-pressure balloon or uh, other tools that you would suggest? I think that you, any time that, that you have implanted the stent, and you have a gross under expansion and you are doing something, in a way you are doing a bailout, a bailout maneuver. It should not have happened. I mean, you should have prepared the plaque properly before deploying the stent. So that should, is something that should not have happened. Now, when you talk about bailout maneuvers, you know, you can use a very high pressure balloon. You, even you may consider, for example, the use of IVL, Again, knowing that probably in a freshly deployed stent, you may have um, um, problems with the, the disruption of the neointimal, the, the, sorry, the antiproliferative uh, cover. You may detach the polymer, for, perhaps. But you know that that's a bailout situation. If you really have a grossly underexpanded stent, it's a problem. You really have to bail out from it. But again, my, the message is. 
Um, whatever you do, if you have uh, a state that is not and is, uh, properly expanded, is, is a very large situation because it should have been prepared properly before. I think this is an important message I would like to highlight and to differentiate two things, which I think two messages which should not conflate. So what you have been talking about until now is the first procedure 18 months ago. So let us say in 2019. So that procedure ended with angiographically obvious underexpansion of the stent, which resulted in, to, in, in 2021 in a stent thrombosis. And what you have been talking about up until now is how not to let that happen. So what should have been done, what we should have uh, been doing in, in, in 2019? And all of the OPN high pressure and, and, and even the shock wave that you mentioned with the problems of disruption of the polymer, uh, this all was related to that intervention. Let us now talk about what is now in 2021, where we are confronted with this case. Maybe the first case was not uh, done in, in our cat lab, so now we are confronted with this case. So our question would be, what is your threshold for using intracoronary imaging here? So basically, you see an undilatable lesion, you open the artery, you have a TIMI-3 flow. Uh, what is your thinking about uh, intracoronary imaging, knowing that the undilatable lesion is basically located within the previous implanted stent? Well, personally, and in a way, the, the clinical practice guidelines echo this because there is a recommendation in the clinical practice guidelines about this. I think that every patient where you have a stent failure, you should try to do imaging. That's it's a must because it is, of, as I mentioned before, it is of key importance to understand what went wrong. And you cannot do that just on the grounds of imaging, or, sorry, of angiography, typically. And, and it would be very difficult to, to, to get insights from CT angiography, for example. So it's one of the situations where it is really important. I will say that probably we use it in 90%, I would say, of the cases where we have a um, stent failure. So uh, it's, it's very interesting because we already have uh, some discussion generating in the chat box. And uh, one of the first ideas is please use DCB and the second idea, please use cutting balloon. And I think the question that we just asked you is maybe thinking before that. Let us maybe please do imaging first and then decide which device to use. Since you also mentioned uh, a shockwave as a possibility, for an undilatable lesion prior to, 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 to seeing what's happening um, inside, uh, our question would be, what do you think about the escalation of the complexity and uh, of basically aggressiveness of the approach in the same primary PCI setting? So we need to be realistic about, the, about many colleagues around the world. So if I'm confronted with this patient and I do not have the possibility of, of, of shockwave, for example, maybe uh, it is important first to establish the flow, as you said, and then postpone the intervention, or would you opt for finishing the case here and doing as much as you can to finish the case on that very night? I think that you know you can you can easily uh, try with um, a cutting balloon, for example. It's a very useful tool for uh, dealing with um, a lesion that cannot be uh, expanded with a conventional balloon. Cutting balloon would be a very good option. If you don't have a cutting balloon, you could first perform inflation with one or two wires around. So it is the sort of pulse meant cutting balloon. Um, and of course, I mean, if you have uh, some proficiency on, on shockwave, it would be no problem whatsoever in using it on the acute situation. But, uh, but you know, if you, if you see that simply your, your balloon is, is taking an hourglass uh, shape when you are inflating it, never deploy, deploy the stent because then you will have a, 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 a bigger problem than if you have an undeletable stenosis. I think that that's really the message. Uh, typically, what may happen in the context of an acute coronary syndrome is that you may overlook the degree of calcification. Uh, you know, in cases like the first case, it's not rare that people use um, direct extenting in an acute coronary syndrome. So we use less and less direct extenting. We are more and more aware that it's important to have information from from the. Um, uh, uh, if you don't, are not performing inter, intracoronary imaging from the way that the pre-dilation balloon inflates, etc. So that will be probably uh, my message is about that point. So did you did you finish the case during that night, or was it staged and then finished later after establishing TIMI three flow? Because this is one of the explicit questions we got very specific from the chat box. 
So the, the operator that was doing the the case uh, noticed, you know, this problem. Of course, realized immediately that the patient was coming with a uh, stent thrombosis related to this uh, anterior expansion. And then um, once that TIMI free flow was restored and seeing that with a non-compliant balloon at 25 atmospheres, it was not responding, decided to stop at that point. And then, uh, of course, uh, schedule the case uh, during office hours using uh, an, an alternative technique. And we will discuss why intracoronary lithotripsy or intravascular lithotripsy may be the, the, the technique of choice. So please tell us, let's proceed. Well, you know, the, the, there are, the problem that you have now is that you have um, a layer of metal between you and a very calcific plaque. So you have to really interact with this calcific plaque through the struts. And there are uh, several ways. One of them is laser. Laser was used, you know, particularly um, because it has a photoacoustic uh, property. So you have some, some type of small explosions taking place when you're advancing the laser that may have an effect uh, beyond the, 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 the struts of the stents. You may even, you know, some colleagues have been using also to perform laser during a, a contrast administration, which of course amplifies enormously this uh, phenomenon, and you know, to the risk, to, this is such a risky phenomenon because it generates a lot of CO2 and you can cause some normal flow. And the great thing about IBL is that the, the sound waves generated by the air balloon go nicely through the stent, reach the calcific plaque, and, uh, and may uh, interact, as I will try to show you uh, in the treatment of this particular patient. So probably if at this particular point, again, still uh, making um, clear that it is an off-label indication in a chronically under-expanded stent, uh, we believe that this is a very useful uh, way of treating the problem. So let us see. Good. So let me just uh, move forward. So, well, I, I took some pictures. This was an schedule case. So first of all, let me show you uh, how the problem looks when you use intracoronary imaging, in particular here we're using uh, OCT. So first you can see that in the, in the stent, in the neighbor regions, you have some new intima hyperplasia and some perhaps uh, organizing thrombus as well there. But look at the narrowing that is generated by this uh, huge calcification that is behind the struts. And you can actually even see the calcium behind the um, stent struts at this particular location. So it's a heavy calcification, probably you know a napkin ring calcification at that particular location that is uh, displaying this effect. I'm going to show you this um, in more detail in the next slide, where here we have you know, also a 3D rendering of the OCD images, and you can see the napkin ring phenomenon that you have in, um, in, in caused by the calcium outside. Look at the stent um, enhancement, the radiological imaging, where you can see also the presence of calcium outside the stent. So we have identified clearly the cause, and I think that this is something that is extremely important. Um, when it was, some colleagues were saying that it will immediately move to one particular technique, drug coated balloon or whatever. Of course, this is a dramatic case, but unless you have this type of image, you will not be able to say if you have stent under expansion, stent fracture, if you have neointimal, um, um, neointimal atherosclerosis, or if you have, um, you know, a, Fibrous, um, fibrous tissue as a component of the new intima. It's extremely important to understand what went wrong. I would like to say that it's a dramatic case, but even a clever one, because indeed you stopped during the night, you restored the flow, it was a STEMI, but you took your time to think about which is the mechanism, and so you, your procedure was not guided by Anjo, as usual, it, at the beginning was, okay, restore the flow, but then you use the imaging in order to tell you why this patient came again with an infarctus. So in these slides, I would just like to, to, to tell that um, for operators performing imaging, sometimes we think about mechanism of stent failure has separately, but in this very case, maybe we can say that the three of them, like the under expansion, the thrombus, 
maybe related to a new plaque, we cannot know all the under expansion, and the calcium outside this tent are together in the same lesion. So, if we have to perform a PCI guided by imaging, and in this very case by OCT, how can we analyze these aspects and how they would guide you to choose the tools that you, will, you were talking, talk, talking about, how to choose between them? Maybe, yeah, that's, that's a very good point that Jaskiara made. And I would like to, to intrude with the questions from the chat box that are related to what Jaskiara said. And I think it's, uh, it, it would be nice uh, to hear from you what you think. So there are three questions that are really specific. One is by uh, Dr. Sajan, our friend, who considered using ROTA in this case, rotational thorectomy. Then uh, our colleague Jorge Eduardo said, well, if we over inflate whichever device, for example, uh, you showed that you use shockwave, we could risk major dissections. And then the third comment pertaining to this very question based on, on the images that we saw was uh, by Dr. Apurva, who suggested that we should have used OPN high pressure balloon before anything else. So what do you think on these three things? Rotational thorectomy in this case, given that the calcium was outside of the stent as seen on the images, then OPN, or refrain from any balloons given, uh, given the risk of, of a major dissection? So, you know, let's start. Um, rotational thorectomy. Well, it's, it's true that you may, the, the intention, of course, will be to get rid first of the stent, but then you will have to, to, to deal with this um, knocking ring calcification, you know, which actually is perhaps tricky because you will need to use a, a large pearl for that. Very important, uh, given how tight this um, in stent narrowing is, the risk of entrapment of your burr is not negligible. Uh, and if you look into the literature, you will find many situations of entrapment of burrs uh, when trying to go through a stent. With orbital atherectomy, it's very simple. It is already forbidden. I mean, uh, the orbital atherectomy from the very scratch, the, the instructions is that you should never use it inside a previously implanted stent. So I think that this is for rotational thorectomy. Now, if you try to go a drag uh, a cutting balloon, obviously will not work because the blades uh, actually will not be able to interact with the plaque that you have outside. High pressure balloon, well, the operator tried with 25 atmospheres, perhaps if you go to 40 atmospheres with, with another high, very high pressure balloon, you will be able to break it. So that's another alternative perhaps. But um, let me just uh, show you how uh, in our strategy works. Okay, uh, show us then, please, what did you do? So the, the strategy was um, going for um, show wave, which, as you know, is dilating the stenosis. At, well, it's not dilating the stenosis. It's a balloon inflated at four atmospheres only inside and allowing, you know, that the sound waves generated by the emitters inside the balloon reach um, the plaque that is behind the stent. And here you've seen that actually we had to deliver a lot of energy, but look at the dramatic uh, morphology. We always use this rotational uh, angiography and just moving the gantry, you know, to make sure that it's fully expanded. And, uh, and look to what happened at the waist of this stent. I mean, it has disappeared entirely. And again, I'm insisting, this is an off-label treatment, but in this particular case, it's a chronically expanded stent. I'm not going to interfere already, you know, with the, the delivery of drug that uh, took place uh, before. Um, and if again, if we go to some um, images, you know, uh, selected from this uh, OCT run, here you can see on the top, you can see first in angiography, how the waste persists, you know, even over the first 50 hits of um, IBL, it persisted, but then suddenly opens very nicely. And when you look to, um, to it with OCT, look at this beautiful expansion of the stent, which actually is, it's because the uh, IBL has been able to interact with the calcium ring that was behind the struts, of course. Great. Really, really great case and congratulations on the result. One question we got from the Philippines. Dr. Jose Nicolas Cruz basically asks, if we do not have OCT, and your decision making here was based on OCT, but if we do have IVAS, in this specific case, but also generally, 
in ISR patients, in patients with instant stenosis. What can we do with IVUS that can help us guide the intervention? Or in this case, IVUS will be um, exactly as useful as OCT and positive, because IVUS will be absolutely great in showing you the stent silhouette and showing you that there is growth under expansion. You know, it may even happen that IVUS will not be able to cross. You know, um, but if, if you if you get uh, across it you will certainly see very similar images, perhaps not as crisp, not as high resolution as with OCT, but certainly containing the same information. So IBUS will be a great alternative to OCT in this particular case. And Chiara, question for you, which is that you use for the cases of stent failure, IBUS or OCT or interchangingly? We, we usually use the OCT because uh, maybe we, we are now more confident except that for left main uh, failure, uh, stand failure, but uh, uh, absolutely we have more clear definition of the plaque and so maybe of the mechanism of, of the failure. So we usually use OCT. But I, I would I would just like to, to ask you. So after after this case, uh, would you reconsider to use a bailout technique like the EVL in the STEMI of the 2019? bailout for bailout after seeing what happened? Absolutely, yeah. I think I think I certainly will do it. Again, I, am, I, I keep emphasizing that it's an off-label indication. But remember, uh, you are in a difficult situation. You implanted a stand. You know, uh, obviously the plug was not properly prepared. You have now growth under expansion that is not uh, responding to a more conventional treatment like high pressure balloon. You really have to do something about it. And it may happen, you know, that this bailout situation will um, make your stent less optimal in preventing restenosis. Perhaps, you know, because perhaps you can detach some of the um, antiproliferative cover. Once I say that, I think that you will not remove the antiproliferative cover that is between the plaque and the strut, so I, the abluminal part of it. So I think that perhaps, you know, there is less effect than, than ever. But you have to really uh, correct that situation because this case exemplifies that you are leaving the patient at a risk in the future. Absolutely. One technical question in terms of using the um, IVL. How is it that you place the balloon, uh, the balloon, the shockwave balloon, in terms of uh, the markers, the balloon markers, in relation to your target lesion? In this case, uh, it's within the stent. Well, this case was very easy because you have the tightest uh, part, you know, of the the hourglass morphology, so you know exactly which is the, the, the area where the stent is compromised by the calcium around it. Um, but it is true, uh, once said that, that what you see with uh, lithotrips in this situation is that sometimes you have to treat the whole segment. Um, and you know, it's so, so probably, you know, you need to not to stick to a particular location, but also try to treat a few millimeters before and after, because sometimes you are able to modify the plaque in these locations, and then subsequently the next hits are more effective in the tightest uh, region of the stenosis. Okay, thank you very much. I think we uh, can move on. And I think as a sort of a, of a summary of what we have seen in this first case, please, we should not forget that uh, stent failure is a real phenomenon. It occurs at a continuous risk. These are data from 2020 published, and this is a, a large data pool of uh, different trials comprising more than 19,000 patients with uh, different types of uh, stents. As you can see, in the first year, within the first year of implantation, there is a marked difference between the stent types in terms of stent-related events. Of course, the second generation DS being the best. However, after the first year, if you look percent-wise, percent the stent-related events keep accruing for all different stent types at roughly the similar pace. And that is 2% annual rate of stent-related events after the first year of implantation. So, and there was in this study, which ended at a five-year follow-up, there was no plateau. So you basically could say that after the first year of implantation, stent-related events, target lesion failure or stent failure, is a real problem, and we will keep seeing it in our CAT labs uh, as we move on uh, having, treated, ha having treated more and more patients. So I think that uh, what uh, Dr. Escanet showed is something which is really important to keep in mind for our everyday, for our everyday practice. Now, we need to differentiate 
between the biology and mechanics when talking and treating when talking about uh, this uh, phenomenon and when, when treating these patients. So uh, very late stent failure, and this was uh, the case uh, presented 18 months after the first stent implantation. It could be due to uh, knee atherosclerosis even without uh, the unexpanded portion of the stent. And you see here in this image on the far left the stent which is marked in white and then uh, the pools of lipid which are within the stent. So we have basically, if you can say quote unquote, the new plaque which is formed, neoatherosclerosis, which is formed within the old stent, which can then progress to rupture. And you see here uh, how it looks like when it ruptures and then you have a STEMI. You basically have a new myocardial infarction. Most it can be of course a non-STEMI as well, but it is a new event. And this can be, and this can explain how patients treated with PCI can have events during the follow-up that are related to the stent and that are clinically meaningful. What you see here are pictures from the PESTO registry, which is a French registry published in 2016, which basically documented that in uh, most of the cases of stent thrombosis, there was some sort of a mechanical failure as well. So it looks uh, like it's a combination of biology and mechanics when it comes to the stent failure. And uh, one question for Dr. Escanet in this regard would be, do you think that the fact that we here had uh, under expansion, could this have triggered uh, the neoatherosclerosis that was also present here and that ultimately resulted in a plaque rupture of this uh, neoatherosclerotic plaque and the STEMI? Well, absolutely. I mean, um, I, although per perhaps and we will see later some cases where we have this uh, tissue, neotherosclerosis, that you have mentioned about, but it's true that there is an interplay probably between hemodynamics and the type of tissue you have. Something very important, uh, Dejan, when I was a fellow in the early 90s, you know, uh, I was in, in the Thorax Center, we were involved in research uh, where we thought that um, new restenosis particularly inside the stents, was a response to injury phenomenon with the same type of tissue coming out. That was basically fibrous tissue with loose um, extracellular matrix. Okay, that was called neointimal hyperplasia. Uh, but now what we are talking of as the substrate, a very common substrate for restenosis is an entirely different uh, tissue. As you mentioned, it's called neotherosclerosis. And you have to understand that the trigger is not a response to injury phenomenon. That may happen, but more frequently, it is a, a process that involves the um, inclusion, well, uh, very similar phenomenon to what happens um, in atherosclerosis. New vascularization plays a very important role. The appearance of cholesterol inside the neointima is related to phenomena mediated by um, this um, neovascularization. So that means red blood cells that go into the plaque and that with the um, membranes contribute to the cholesterol inside uh, the neointima, etc. And as you say, it may easily uh, contribute to have um, an event in the long term. There's one additional aspect here that is important. If you have a stent that is underexpanded, probably through a Venturi effect, what you are having is some um, hemodynamics that promote actually some type of tissue with particular type of new vascularization. This is something that we know. And finally, a very important aspect, the place where you land with the distal part of the stent or the proximal part of the stent. If you land in an area that is a lipid-rich plaque, we know that there is a, a tremendous um, stimuli over there to develop new atherosclerosis in the edges of the stent. Great, thank you very much. I would like to ask Chiara to summarize the case for us in terms of the evidence-based medicine as we try to, to progress further. Well, it's a pleasure to conclude this case that was uh, really, really educating. So, we cannot change our patient. We are facing a STEMI, so there are STEMI-related factors. And, of course, we cannot change the reperfusion delay. We have to be as fast as possible. But what we can improve, and there are papers suggesting us to use them, is the imaging with the NOCT guidance and the use of some tools like the drug creating balloon or, in some cases where calcium is predominant, the uh, intravascular lithotripsy, even if we still don't know if they can really impact the long-term outcomes of our patient. But please, as you suggested, please move on with the, our second case of the day.
Thank you, Kiera. So, um, so I selected this case because we are going to see an entirely different substrate for restenosis here. This is a very similar age, 76 year old uh, gentleman, again, some cardiovascular risk factors, also six months before admission, an inferior STEMI that was uh, treated with a uh, drug eluting stent in the um, ostium of the right coronary artery, or proximal segment of the right coronary artery. And now, interestingly, um, subsequently, the patient a few days later was uh, brought back to the cath lab to treat a non culprit stenosis, the LAD. And then the operator decided to check what was the status of the infrared artery, and he found that there was subclinical stent thrombosis. So after performing some maneuvers, he decided to extend also the proximal part of the, of the, of the vessel. So you have then two stents uh, partially overlapped, one of them in the proximal RCA and the other one extending from the proximal to the osteal uh, RCA. Now, um, the, what, I'm, what I'm going to show you now is uh, are the, the images that you see here. And this is uh, months after this was treated. Uh, you have now a severe restenosis, as you can see here. You probably can uh, differentiate the area where you have some overlap of the stents and the proximal part. So most of the restenosis actually seems to be in the proximal stent that was implanted uh, in the area that apparently there was some uh, thrombosis. So first thing that we have to do, as mentioned before, is to understand what is going there. Already from angiography, it doesn't seem to be a problem of under expansion, but let's have a look to, to this and then let's try to understand. This is the osteum of the RCA, lots of calcium. And, um, and as we move um, inside the vessel, we start seeing the struts. This is the new ultron system. There are some changes, but look at that. The stent has virtually disappeared. And the reason because it has disappeared is because there is so much lipid content inside this new intima that the shadow that it generates impedes seeing the stents struts that are located um, beyond you know all this lipid so it is an, on the top of that you have a number of features like uh, the presence of macrophages and a very heterogeneous structure of the this new intima that speaks of course of um, uh, a very uh, biological active uh, phenomenon going there, probably mediated with lots of inflammation on the grounds of seeing this uh, presence of uh, macrophages. So let me show you in detail the, the images. Again, if you first, if you look to the right one, from 10 to 12, basically, you can see a few struts, but you can see that you see no struts, the shadows of the stent struts in any of the other arc of the vessel. Again, Look, of the, look to the, the tremendous drop in penetration of the, of the light caused by the extensive presence of lipid. Look at these uh, bright bands that you can see over there that are a mix of macrophages and perhaps cholesterol crystal clefts. So in summary, a very strong um, neothersclerotic response probably with lots of uh, inflammation associated to it. Thank you. So just to reiterate, you see it on the slide here that just pops up what uh, Dr. Escanet said. So basically we have an osteal RCA instead restenosis with a neoatherosclerotic plaque that seems to be biologically active. A lot of lipid and even signs of inflammation. What you see in uh, white are the stent struts and it shines on OCT. And then you have also shining parts which are not stent struts. These are the particles that uh, Dr. Escanet was referring to, like macrophages or uh, crystals of cholesterol, which are then attenuating the signal behind them. What is important, I think, and uh, there was a question uh, which uh, we did not address, and it was related to the first case, about whether we should at the end stent after correcting the under expansion, and this question can be asked here as well. So I think I would start with that question and then ask uh, Professor Escaned uh, about his thoughts. So when I was basing my decisions on angiography only, I, I was very tempted to stent most of those lesions because on angiography, as you could see in the second case particularly, you just see practically a subtotal occlusion of the 
a big RCA, which is very important for the patient, given the fact that the LAD was also stenotic and was also revascularized. So based on angiography, you would think, okay, I would try with a balloon, then I do not get a satisfactory result angiographically, and then I proceed with stenting, get a better result, and then I seem to be, I seem to be content. However, I added a second layer of the stent, and now seeing all these intravascular images, that uh, were provided by Dr. Escaned, I'm more and more convinced that this may not have been the best idea of all. So the question, and this may be also the answer to the colleague, is that uh, when we have the cases of stent failure, we really need to double, triple, and many more times think before placing another stent. We need, of course, to establish the flow, but then we need to really think about what to do, and I think intracoronary imaging help us there immensely. So the specific question for this case, the first case was about not being expanded well in the initial procedure and the related problems there. The second case is more about the fact that biologically this patient, after only eight months, had such a neoatherosclerosis, such a response in building new lipid plaque within the implanted stent, that the question, the fair question is, which device do you think now you would consider for treating such, such a lipid-rich plaque, given also the threat of no reflow, which was also mentioned in the chat box? Yeah, thank you. That's, that's a very good point. Let me just uh, first take the question of the colleague before saying, in, in the case of this is case of, case of under expansion, uh, would you use IBUS if you don't have OCT? And I was saying, absolutely, you will meet a beautiful diagnosis. Now, in this particular case, IBUS will not reveal all with all this detail, you know, what is really going on. It will simply show you that there is soft plaque. So you really need OCT if you really want to go to the degree of granularity where you can really examine biological phenomenon like inflammation, present from macrophages, cholesterol, crystal clefts, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a big, big difference. Um, now, regarding the way of treating this, again, uh, is it a problem of the stent or is it a problem of the patient? I think that we here we have a problem of the patient probably. We have a problem, you know, we have a substrate that is actually um, mediating a lot of lots of inflammation in this particular patient. So that's something that you will have to keep in mind in terms of being as perhaps as aggressive, aggressive as possible in your um, in your cardioprotective drugs and in, in secondary prevention in this particular patient, lipid lowering agents, uh, anti-inflammatory uh, effect of statins or whatever. But you have soft plaque. So the adding a, a layer of a stent probably is not something that is going to solve the situation. The idea that we have here, you have soft tissue that you can extrude through the stent struts. Uh, you can obtain a good lumen. And next thing that you should do is to uh, provide a drug that is antiproliferative and that therefore prevents, you know, a response to injury phenomenon that will narrow your stent. And so that's reason because what we will try is first to optimize the the obtain a good lumen and subsequently use a drug, um, a lutein balloon. Okay. Before to go to the conclusion, uh, and despite the imaging that uh, suggests us that it's a soft plaque, you uh, spoke about a patient problem. Yes, but since the restenosis is at the proximal edge of our stent, would you think that maybe it's even a undersized stent problem? Because probably the stent was too small for the ostium of a uh, right coronary artery? Well, personally, I, I don't think that in this particular case you have a problem of under-expansion. I mean, you, you have a stent that is roughly 3.5 millimeter. Um, so to, my impression is that that uh, is a proper, properly a, a good size. Remember that, for example, in the Illumium 4 trial, vessels that are 3.5 millimeters uh, and above were excluded from the trial because it is assumed that the chances of restenosis is very small. So Illumium 4 is dedicated to vessels that may undergo restenosis. So my impression is that in this particular case, you have more, it has more to do perhaps with the substrate at the level of the plaque and the substrate at the level of the patient in terms of what has happened here. We don't know, of course. What I can also tell you is that um, we have a paper that will be uh, has been accepted for publication, will be published soon, uh, with my colleague um, uh, Nieves Gonzalo, and it's a pool analysis of uh, the RIPS trials with OCT examination, the OCT analysis of different RIPS trials, and we look to whether 
dragulitin balloon or um, uh, dragulitin stents uh, were associated with better outcomes in patients with neotherosclerosis. I'm talking about this particular subset. And uh, in this, in this uh, investigation, we found no difference in outcomes. So it seems like it is reasonable to use a drug lutein balloon or a drug or a drug lutein uh, stent uh, in this uh, type of subset because there were already two layers of metal. We decided to go for drug lutein balloon. So please let's show the uh, treatment of your patient and the final result. So the case was guided with OCT. I'm not going to go through the uh, whole. Um, to the, to the whole uh, cascade of treatments. But you can see here first the baseline uh, lumen profile obtained automatically with the OCT system. Um, and here you can see after a cutting balloon and 3.0 non-compliant balloon, how it was uh, significantly improved. But look how with a 3.5 non-compliant balloon, um, we obtained a much better lumen. We were happy with that. And then we went with the drug uh, coated balloon or drug lutein balloon. So what you are seeing here are basically the, is the final step of applying the dry lutein balloon. Um, we are, we're using, of course, uh, the uh, extend enhancement to make sure that we were treating the region that we wanted. Um, you can see that in the in the lower uh, left corner. Uh, with the immediately after that, of course, we performed um, OCT. We try not to perform additional uh, treatments once that we have delivered the drug with the drug uh, lutein balloon. But what it was very interesting in this particular case um, is something that we are going to discuss in a second and has to do with the previously implanted stent. Let's now, uh, I would like to handle it back to, to, to you, uh, uh, Dejan. Yes. Do you want to comment yes. something about the, yes. the structure of the restenosis? Yes, in the interest of time, I'm going to mention this, and we are going to answer to some of the chat box questions which we have received later after the, after the webinar so that uh, everybody could see also our third case. Regarding this case, I think it is important to, to say that uh, the uh, imaging guidance, in particular OCT, can provide us uh, with uh, clues how to treat the patient, and we have talked about this throughout the whole webinar. And these are some of the emerging data showing that uh, the quality or the pattern of the neointima inside the stent may drive us towards this or that solution. So in case of homogeneous neointima where uh, the tissue uh, is more fibrotic, uh, it looks like the TCB uh, showed uh, comparable results uh, with the DES with, of course, the benefit of, of leaving nothing behind, of not putting another layer of stents. And this was in an observational cohort published this year. In heterogeneous neointima, DES seemed to be better in this observational cohort. However, I think that we should uh, under, underscore uh, just what Dr. Escanet said uh, about the paper he's preparing, that the so far randomized di the data do, do try to point that uh, comparable outcomes seem to be achieved with uh, the benefit of, uh, as I said, leaving nothing behind. However, RIPS 4 and 5 did show difference in MACE, but only in terms of the revascularization, and this was probably due to the acute gain that you can achieve with, uh, with a stent. But uh, let us perhaps proceed further and let us uh, see how this case was concluded by Dr. Escanet and his team. Well, this is something that, of course, is a bonus when you perform interconal imaging. We found that out of the problem region, there was an additional problem in this uh, stent that was deployed. And you can see that actually the stent was grossly underexpanded, uh, sorry, uh, malaposed. So the, you can see here that the vessel at this point was roughly four millimeters in diameter, but the stent that is not touching the wall um, has a um, size of about 3.27 millimeters. So what to do in a patient where you find this degree of malaposition who, who had already a stent failure? Well, we, we discussed it for a while, you know, but we decided to uh, inflate a balloon of 4.0 to expand this stent to make them touch the wall. No need for additional uh, drug lutein balloon because we are not overstretching the vessel. We are simply, you know, bringing uh, these stents, uh, strut stents uh, out of the middle of the lumen. So we normalize hemorrheology and we probably decrease the possibility of having uh, a problem derived from that. 
And the result from that was uh, actually very good. So, yes, uh, it is important, I think, to highlight once again here that uh, the Mala position has been debated as a possible cause of uh, stent failure or maybe the result of uh, delayed healing process and late inflammation uh, of the vessel wall, which was then causing the Mala position. And it should be differentiated from the uncovered struts, which have also uh, been identified as causes of, of stent failure, because you could have uncovered struts without Mala position. So I would like to uh, ask Chiara to conclude this case, and then I would like to, uh, uh, Dr. Escanet to move on. Yes, this second case was a, a real demonstration on how malaposition and neo, uh, new plaque like neoatherosclerosis can really uh, determine the uh, restenosis and the failure of our stent. And uh, since we now have a lipid-rich neo plaque in the osteal RCA, we cannot change this, but we can use evidence in this case. OCT was very, very useful, above all, for understanding the malaposition. And the drug creating balloon is the real choice in this case in order to improve the long-term outcomes and reduce the double layer of stent in this patient. And now we can move to the third case, please. Thank you. Thank you, Chiara. So the first, third case, very simple, is to show you this 64-year-old uh, gentleman, cardiovascular risk factors, and he had a very metal stent 20 years before the index procedure. Actually, he was uh, asymptomatic most of this time until recently he had a progressive angina. Now, uh, what I wanted to emphasize here is the point that in a single um, restenosis, so to speak, you may have many different causes in terms of tissue, of obliterating tissue. As you can see here, you have in this particular segment a new intima, um, neotherosclerosis uh, with also some areas of calcium. Then you have here more extensive calcific neointima. Very important. Remember, you will not be able to diagnose this unless you performed a, a intracoronary imaging. You may even have, you know, um, lots of lipids, and in some occasions you will even see cholesterol crystal clefts. You have a variety, a palette of um, tissue in the neointima. What we did in these patients? Well, remember, if you have calcific neointima, you cannot extrude this tissue through the stent struts by uh, just, uh, you know, using a, 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 a balloon. More importantly, you cannot implant a stent because if you implant a stent, I will show you what happens. It's, it will be a big disaster. So what we did is we used the cutting balloon, trying to break as much as possible this uh, calcific tissue, dry, and then we also performed a high-pressure balloon and a drug adjudicating balloon to finalize with. And um, let me very simply uh, show you the consequences of stenting in this particular situation. If you put a second stent in a patient who has restenosis with calcific neointima, what you will have is a sandwich of calcium, a metal, metal calcium metal that will be very difficult to handle later on. So never ever implant a second stent if you have made a diagnosis of calcium uh, in the neointima. Uh, in this particular case, uh, again, we, the intravascular lithotripsy came to help us. Probably laser will be another alternative as well in this particular situation. But in this case, we were able to break this sandwich of metal, calcium metal, with intravascular lithotripsy and to um, open the vessel uh, to a proper dimension, subsequently use a drug eluting problem. So maybe before we uh, proceed with the, with the conclusions, there were several questions in the chat box, and I, Chiara and myself have also discussed it uh, over these months, is how do you use drug-coated balloons? So can you speak to us about the procedural details? Do you inflate for 30 seconds or 60 seconds? Do you use longer or shorter? How do you prepare? How do you prepare? What is your technique for using drug coating balloons? And then do you differentiate between paclitaxel and cerulimus eluding? Do you think there is a class effect or not? So three questions in one. Thank you. So in terms of plaque preparation, uh, cutting balloons are very useful for two reasons. First, because in many occasions in restenotic lesions, you have a, a melon seed phenomenon that, uh, you know, it's is addressed by having a cutting balloon. Second one is that by cutting the new intima, it's more possible perhaps to extrude it through the struts 
and also perhaps better possible, more chances of delivering in depth the drug with the drug lithium balloon. And third is the duration of the inflation. Well, if depends on the anatomical location. If the patient um, allows an inflation of one minute, then we keep it um, over one minute. Otherwise, we make two separate inflations, you know, of about 30 seconds, uh, with re and we, we perform the new inflation again. Once that we have uh, deployed the drug with drug lithium balloon, we perform no further uh, manipulation of the segment. Okay, and do you see the difference among the different balloons? What is your uh, opinion there? The ones that have been available for longer are the ones, Paclitaxel lithium balloons, is because the technology was much simpler. Paclitaxel is a very lipophilic drug, so it's very easy that it penetrates the neointima just by staying there for a while. Cyrolimus uh, came with nanotechnology, so you have a different, completely different technology of either microspheres or ma microparticles that get adhered to the neointima. Uh, and recently, we also have technology with BioLimus, which, which uh, you know, is, is, is upcoming. So, but for the time being, you know, we assume that probably the three technologies can be perhaps as efficient in terms of anti neoproliferative uh, responses. So we could say that on the contrary of the previous case, <clears throat> where you just used a drug creating balloon, when you have uh, not a soft plaque but calcium neoatherosclerosis, please prepare with cutting balloon before your drug creating balloon. Is this your message? Yes, I think in general, as I say, we have a very low threshold to use cutting balloons in all type of uh, in stem restenosis, with the exception of the first type of patient that I show, where you have a gross, um, you know, under expansion of the stent, because the blades will do, will do nothing uh, against an stent that is uh, under expanded. And you even used it in the second case, which was predominantly lipid rich case. Even though, of course, at the ostium of this of, of the RCA, which is uh, at, the, at the sole ostium, it could be, of course, a harder plaque, a thicker plaque. But you nevertheless used it, even though it was predominantly lipid rich. Particularly if we have, you know, we do it in most cases. But you know, particularly if you have trifers with a balloon and you see a melon seed phenomenon, don't try to inflate it more times. Go directly to it because you will. The slippage of the balloon may cause dissection in the neighbor segments, so it's better that you really perform proper uh, dilatation with the dry lithium balloons. It remains to be demonstrated whether the cutting of the neointima um, allows better that the, the drug permeates better from the balloon to the neointima and results in better protective uh, result, better uh, antiproliferative effect. If for the time being, it's just hypothetical. So thank you. To conclude this case, I think uh, the last slide that we wanted to show and to highlight what was the specific about this case. Can we have, please have the next slide? It is the fact that we really had a lot of calcium within the neoatherosclerosis. So this was the take home from the last case. And if you go from left to right, this is not what you should attempt to do. Because if you place another stent within a stent that already has calcified neoatherosclerosis, we are not going to be successful. And this is why intracoronary imaging is important. And this is why I think was the only webinar in our series where you could see less angiographic images, but more OCT intracoronary imaging. This is a topic, stent failure, where understanding of the mechanism of stent failure really does make a difference in terms of the treatment and optimal management strategy. To reiterate, in the first case, you saw gross underexpansion as the cause. Then you saw more biological cause of a neoatherosclerosis with a lot of lipids. And then in the third case, what you could see is a calcified neoatherosclerosis 20 years after the initial PCI, which was then resolved with uh, extensive um, dilatations with the cutting balloons and then finished with a drug coated balloon. In all three cases, Dr. Escanet basically used uh, balloons, drug-coated balloons, and did not plant a stent based on the intracoronary imaging findings. So, Chiara, could you conclude this case and the whole webinar? Yeah. 
Absolutely, as uh, you, you, you told. Uh, here we have a concentric calcium in the Neo Intima. So as usual, as uh, Professor Scaned teached us, please use imaging to guide your type of revascularization and above all to choose your tools. Because in this case, for the calcium cutting balloon before drug creating balloon can really improve the spread of the drug inside the wall of the vessel and so improve our long-term outcomes. So, as you summarized, we saw a stent under expansion treated with the bailout intravascular lithotripsy, then we treat a lipid-rich neo-intima plaque with drug quitting balloon, and at the end, a calcified neo-intima plaque with cutting balloon and drug creative balloon. But for sure, we need, of, of course, by using them more and more, more data about the intracoronary imaging guided PCI and the use of DCB for stent failure. So I'd like to thank you very much, Professor Escanet, for this educating webinar. It was a real pleasure to share with you and to teach from your experience. And we would like to Please, please, please tell us. Yeah, I would like to say thank you very much for visiting us in Madrid, in Hospital Clinic San Carlos, and for bringing along all the colleagues that have been participating in, in the webinar. Thank and you. we hope to visit your hospital in person. And uh, we'd like to thank PCR to support these webinars and Concept Medical. And of course, with my colleague, we'd like to wish you all a Merry Christmas. We uh, hope to have a 2022 full of live webinar in person. It would be great. <laughs> exactly. Thank you very much once again. Best Thank wishes you. to all for the new year. Thank you very Thank much. You.